This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Heart and Vascular Grand Rounds. Um, this morning, we have uh, someone who's a familiar face, but is visiting us from another institution. Dr. Gopal uh, did her bachelor's and MD and a combined degree at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, came here for internal medicine, cardiology fellowship, finished her cardio cardiology fellowship up at BU. While she was here, she worked with Javed Butler in a variety of projects, and then did advanced heart failure and transplant um, fellowship at the Brigham and Women. She's currently an assistant professor at BU, has, uh, has uh, done extremely well with quite a, quite a few publications moving forward uh, very, very impressively in her career. And she's going to tell us to all today, explain everything we need to know about phenotyping, metabolic heart disease, and preclinical heart failure as preserved via. Welcome. Thank Good you. to have you back. Thank you. Well, I'm thrilled to be back at Emory to talk about some of the work I've been doing at BU. Emory is near and dear to my heart because this is where I started doing cardiovascular research. I started um, in the lab with David Harrison doing NOx5 with endothelial cells and then transitioned to heart failure research with Javed Butler in the clinical investigator tract. And I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to continue my heart failure inquiry with Bill Colucci at BU. And we've been collaborating and working together for the last 10 years on this entity of heart failure, but specifically mm -hmm. in preclinical HFPEF. And that's what I'd like to talk to about today, phenotyping metabolic heart disease. So doing clinical research in heart failure with preserved EF, you don't have to dig deep to find the problem. And as we all know in this group, the there are no proven therapies for heart failure with preserved EF. We've been plagued with negative trials, with iPreserve, with um, ARBs, with ACE inhibitors, with digoxin, beta blockers, and Let's not forget our more recent failures with RELAX, mineralocorticoid antagonists, and then just as recently as last month with our um, ARNIs in um, Paragon as well. So it's been a difficult struggle over the last uh, decade at least in really trying to identify therapeutics that will impact this disease entity. And when you really look at the literature, there's a variety of reasons and questions that have been raised. Is this related to our actual trials? Are we enrolling the right people with these individuals? Uh, as all of us have been involved, I remember when I was here at Emory, we were enrolling for TopCat, and it was extremely difficult to enroll these individuals. So trying to find the right people that can get enrolled, so it's slow enrollment, and are these even the right individuals? And again, a lot of other nuances that come with heart failure with preserved EF, and I think it really comes down to this idea of, that many of us have heard about that heart failure with preserved EF is truly a hetero heterogeneous disease. When we're on wards and we see these HFPEF individuals, there's such a variety of individuals. They clearly have clinical heart failure, but they have different manifestations, whether they have a lot of kidney disease, they're older individuals, pulmonary hypertension, some RV dysfunction in that, and then they have that metabolic phenotype where they're young and obese and have different varying degrees of hypertension and diabetes. And so really trying to get at that is very difficult. In the more recent years, uh, some investigators have tried to look at it in a more unsupervised and an unbiased fashion. How can we look at this disease entity and really try to find categories that may have meaning in terms of characteristics and also that can correlate with outcomes? And Sanjeev Shah and Rahul Deo applied on the earlier end of things, I think, in the machine learning space of applying it in the cardiovascular arena and looking at machine learning in HFPEF patients. And they had 420 individuals where they knew a lot of characteristics about them. They put in their clinical characteristics, echo data, lab data, and they applied it with a cluster analysis to really see applying a machine algorithm. Are they able to come up with bins of these individuals and can they come up with characterization in different um, components and different people that kind of categorize more together? And what they came up with was three groups, for example, this study. And group one is designated in orange. These are younger individuals in their cohort that had lower BNPs and really were had minimal symptoms in terms of New York Heart Association classification. And as you can see, their survival-free uh, of heart failure, of 
cardiovascular hospitalization or death was uh, relatively good in comparison to the other groups. And when you look at group three on the converse, these are the older individuals that had a lot of chronic kidney disease and had high BNPs. And not surprisingly, these individuals conferred the worst risk in this group in their classifications. But what emerged and what we, our group found was quite interesting was there was this group two is designated in blue. They were the obese individuals, the hypertensive individuals, people with diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, the people we see all the time. And they had significant risk. And in fact, they might be even closer to the group three in terms of outcomes. So clearly, having a metabolic phenotype within heart failure confers higher risk. And this again was applied in another, with another group using latent class analysis, but again, a bit of a machine learning approach where looking at a, a trial that was a HEFPEF trial. And with the latent class, they put in actually prospectively 11 variables, anemia, diabetes, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, to just name a few, and then try to see if there were subgroups that differentiated out within these um, HEFPEF groups. And if I can draw your attention to subgroup C, that was the metabolic phenotype. These individuals, everybody had uh, BMIs greater than 30, hypertension, diabetes, high prevalence, and hyperlipidemia. And in this, in Charm Preserved, these individuals conferred the highest risk. And this was event-free survival in terms of these Kaplan-Meier curves. And then similarly, they applied this to I Preserve. And you can see with subgroup C as well, again, it designated in blue, high risk in terms of outcomes. So metabolic heart disease in terms of individuals with metabolic phenotype truly emerging as higher risk in these individuals. And so when I joined up with Bill Colucci, we were talking about how a lot of the focus in heart failure with preserved DF is in this stage C arena, which makes good sense. These are the people that we're seeing on the wards and trying to deal with how are we gonna treat them. But what if we actually move the lens into more of the stage B arena, where these individuals have abnormal structure and function, but haven't ex exhibited heart failure yet? And what, if we are able to identify them, could we actually intervene earlier and be more successful? And really, it made me think of this um, cartoon, which is a, really a favorite movie in our household, and it's Wally. -E. And these individuals are completely never moving around. They're very non-ambulatory. And if you had, this is the question at hand, is if you have two obese individuals that walk into your clinic, which individual is more likely to have HEFPAF? And could you say that right now? And I think we don't have an answer to that, and we wouldn't be able to predict which of them might be at higher risk. And so our question was, which of the individuals have preclinical HEFPEF? And what exactly is preclinical HEFPEF? So before my time uh, joining uh, Bill Colucci's lab, he had been thinking about this idea of what happens when mice eat American Western diets. And so what they tried to look at was with high fat, high sucrose mice, do, what is the cardiac manifestation for that? Just simply introducing a diet. And what they found is in the white bars designating the wild type mice and the hatch lines being the high, fat, high sucrose mice, you can see that there's an increase in wall thickness, and this is two months, five months, and eight months duration. And when they evaluated these mice, they had larger LV and diastolic diameters and systolic diameters and relative wall thickness, meaning they were truly remodeling more of a concentric phenotype. And they remain preserved. When you look at the LV fractional shortening, it was really relatively preserved. So maintaining a diastolic phenotype. When they looked at diastology, again, high fat, high sucrose is designated in the hatch lines, worsening diastolic parameters, increasing your deceleration time, increasing your IVRT, suggesting early diastolic abnormalities, E to A ratio was reducing, and your E prime was reduced in your high fat, high sucrose model. And when they did pressure volume um, assessments with Langendorf um, um, experiments, what we found was that the uh, triangle designating the wild type and the diamond, it's a little bit hard to see here, but it's the more leftward um, of the curves, that the systolic pressure generation was higher at lower volumes, as seen in panel A and panel C, but not statistically different. But what, what did emerge was clearly the classic diastolic um, pressure volume relationship where you have that upward and leftward shift that we see in our end diastolic pressure volume relationships, and that really signifies 
a stiff ventricle and lack of compliance, and we were seeing that in the high-fat, high-sucrose model. When they looked at the myocyte diameter, they found that these myocytes were hypertrophied, larger, and in addition, they had higher degrees and percentage of cardiac fibrosis. So fibrosis was clearly a component of this. These, ind these mice were heavy. They had abnormal glycemic indexes when they measured their um, glucose levels as well. And when trying to look a little bit at mechanism as well, they did find that there was increased oxidative stress in these models as ascertained by nitrotyrosine staining and h &E in terms of lipid peroxidation byproducts. So oxidative stress seemed to be some component of what was driving these abnormalities. We saw thicker hearts, concentric remodeling, and abnormal diastolic dysfunction. So when thinking of that, with what they found in the lab, uh, Bill and I then sat down and tried to think about how could we translate this out into a clinical cohort? What would preclinical cardiac lesions be that we think would predict best um, heart failure with preserved DF and specifically with metabolic disease in the background? And what we really thought made sense was diastolic dysfunction. I think everyone would agree that diastolic dysfunction's presence, it used to be part of the diagnosis for HEFPEF in some of the earlier guidelines. And its presence clearly confers increased risk in terms of mortality, very much so many epidemiologic and community cohorts verified its relationship with incident heart failure. Um, so clearly the presence of diastolic dysfunction is an important preclinical lesion. The presence of LVH we know is very much a, also a strong predisposition predispos uh, to heart failure with preserved DF development. Many, multiple, many and multiple studies have looked at LVH presence, always hypertension. We know that hypertension has the highest attributable risk for incident heart failure. It's been shown decades ago, even with some of the earlier studies in Framingham. But the presence of heart failure, um, LVH, excuse me, in HEFPEF is highly prevalent, and even more so than individuals that just have hypertensive heart disease um, without HEFPEF itself. And then lastly, the presence of pulmonary hypertension, I think we've had a better understanding in the last decade about the importance of pulmonary hypertension. We clearly know there's a higher prevalence of pulmonary hypertension within patients who have HEFPEF compared even to those that just have hypertensive disease and have not had uh, hypertension. And even the presence of hypertension in the community can confer 10 millimeters of mercury um, increase, can confer over a 2.7 fold higher increase of mortality in community cohorts. So clearly the presence of pulmonary hypertension confers risk and we know associates very strongly with HEFPEF. So in thinking of these preclinical lesions, we then sat down and dis uh, designed our study, which is what I worked on when I first went up to BU. And we came up in our BUMETS, it's a BU metabolic heart disease study, where we essentially tried to go after these individuals and recruit to have a cohort that we could really analyze. So we recruited individuals between 2010 and 2014. And really trying to look at that metabolic phenotype, we went after individuals who had metabolic syndrome. We were recruiting these individuals from outpatient clinics, mainly um, the endocrine clinic and the weight loss clinic, some in cardiovascular clinic, but mainly because they were being managed with some element of hypertension, and metabolic syndrome. As you all know, it's the waist circumference, 88 centimeters for women, 102 for men. They had uh, low LDLs, uh, increased triglycerides greater than 150, diabetes, either presence of a fasting glucose greater than 100 or the presence of an anti um, a hypoglycemic agent or hypertension, again, greater than 130, systolic blood pressure or on at least one antihypertensive medication. So if they had three out of five, they met the metabolic syndrome and they were considered, um, we could include them. We also wanted to tease out a little bit about the diabetes question. There's a lot of literature in the basic science world about diabetic cardiomyopathy. They tend to be a diastolic model that has a lot of fibrosis. And how diabetes plays into that can be somewhat nuanced. So we just wanted to see what the impact of just being obese with one or two risk factors and not having diabetes, how those people look like from a cardiac phenotype. And really, these individuals had minimal cardiovascular disease. They could no, not have prevalent heart failure at all, but really they had no significant disease of um, coronary disease, significant valvular disease, any EF less than 50%. Um, if incidental found on, once we did their echo, they were excluded from the analysis. So really, these were a young group of people 
not really in cardiology clinics, more in endocrine or weight loss clinics that were felt to be the healthier obese. And these, this is the group that we targeted. What we did when we brought them in is we did blood work on everybody. We did carotid femoral, carotid radial to take a look at arterial stiffness, which I won't discuss today. And then we also looked at echocardiography to just really get an understanding of how these individuals without any known cardiovascular disease, how do they look from a cardiac structure and function perspective? So from a cardiac, just to give a sense of the, the cohort itself, these individuals were quite young. So the control group, you can see the mean was around 43, and our obese and metabolic syndrome group was similarly um, younger in age. The metabolic syndrome did have, they were slightly older in comparison to the other two groups, particularly with the controls. This was a high prevalence of women, actually, in the study. And we were um, pleased to see that the group represented our demographic that we see at Boston Medical Center, which is very similar in some ways to Grady. We have a, it's the city hospital of Boston and a high immigrant population. We have a lot of Afro-Caribbean uh, immigrant population that come and get their care at um, BMC. So very high prevalence of African-American um, participants, in which we do see an enhanced phenotype of the metabolic risk that has been seen in epidemiologic cohorts with um, African-Americans. Higher systolic blood pressure that, um, in, that kind of went gradationally across the groups, but highest in metabolic syndrome. And these individuals were large. Their BMIs were 40 in both the obese and the metabolic syndrome group. The, as according to study design, we had diabetes was included with the metabolic syndrome, and we had a prevalence about 40% versus the obese and the controls had no diabetes. And um, in terms of renal dysfunction, pretty stable and un, um, not different between the groups. And so one of the first questions we asked was, when you look at a spectrum of metabolic phenotype, whether the person has obesity and then did they actually have full-fledged metabolic syndrome, what does their cardiac structure and function look across this metabolic phenotype? And what we found is that clearly the presence of more of a, a more metabolic phenotype conferred changes in particular aspects of the, um, the cardiac structure and function. LV diastology, most notably, was increased in the, uh, it worsened between moving from obese to um, metabolic syndrome. So as they moved from obese into metabolic syndrome, we really saw abnormalities that were significantly different between these groups. E to A ratios, the mean E prime started becoming abnormal. Now these changes are subtle. These are healthy individuals. So the mean E prime, for example, in the metabolic syndrome group was nine. So it's not, if you know, a mean of like eight and a half or so would be considered truly abnormal mean and not just lateral or septal, but starting to get truly in the abnormal range. And then the E to, a, e, to e prime ratio was also moving abnormally. We noticed that the E prime, tricuspid E prime RV diastology was abnormal. Um, so a bit of some RV function was starting to get abnormal. The systolic function was preserved throughout all three groups. But we did see that emerge through as a difference between as you move from obese to metabolic syndrome. And we ascertained PASP, pulmonary acceleration time, as our surrogate for um, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. And that clearly became much more abnormal as you moved into a more metabolic phenotype. And we'll talk some more about the pulmonary artery pressures. But what was interesting is that there were clearly variables that just started becoming abnormal once you, if you simply had the presence of obesity. LA diameter, um, more of the relative wall thickness, the concentric changes. Many individuals were concentrically remodeled in obese and some developed concentric hypertrophy by the time they were metabolic syndrome. And when you index your LV mass to height, and we did height because this is an obese population, that's a more accurate um, assessment, LV mass became abnormal in obesity and then worsened in uh, metabolic syndrome. And there were two variables that we did find that were, um, didn't quite track the way that we might have expected. With the LA volume index and the LV EDD, individuals with obesity were actually slightly increased, but when you actually moved into the metabolic syndrome, they were not significantly different from the metabolic phenotype. So that was an uh, somewhat unexpected finding that didn't quite fit the, the normal spectrum of disease that we would um, expect to see perhaps with the metabolic phenotype. And I'll go back into a little bit more of the 
where to go with the LA volume index. And some of the takeaway points that we found with our data was that there was clearly worse diastology um, at younger age in metabolic syndrome. So when you look at age over time, this is a normal type of relationship one expects. As we age, we know that there is some element of um, impaired relaxation, just purely with the aging process, even if you don't have diastolic uh, heart failure or significant diastolic disease, that's just part of the aging process. That is a normal relationship that you see. And with our controls, you can see that they started off quite normal. And as those that were across the age spectrum, we see that slight decrease, but all relatively staying within the normal range. But what was impressive is that with the metabolic syndrome, there was clearly effect, effect modification by metabolic status. And those metabolic syndrome individuals had more pronounced decreases in their mini prime, more abnormal, diast abnormal diastology at lower ages. And while the trend continued similarly as a control, that difference between the control line and the, by the time some of the individuals got up to 60 was less pronounced. So clearly, worse diastology in individuals who are young with metabolic syndrome. What was one of the more interesting findings we found was that the pulmonary hypertension, the prevalence of occult pulmonary hypertension was pretty significant in this group. If you pulled the obese and the metabolic syndrome individuals together, about 50 to 60% of individuals had elevated PASPs, meaning PASPs greater than 35. And we had to ascertain PASP using pulmonary acceleration time, which is the slope of the RV outflow tract um, envelope, because 40% of individuals, because these were young individuals, didn't have a TR jet, and that's pretty consistent with other echocardiographic studies in more community cohorts, that it's really hard to get that TR jet, and I'm sure everyone can appreciate that. The acquisition of that is difficult in a lot of individuals. But there have been studies that have looked at PA acceleration time, and we think of PA acceleration time mainly in terms of pulmonary hypertension, but there's been an application of pulmonary acceleration time in normal cohorts, and it really has a very strong row correlation with uh, TR jet velocities and with catheterization. So we use that as a surrogate to get a sense of what the PASP, and we were able to get the pulmonary acceleration time in about 90% of these individuals, which made it for a much more um, appropriate uh, um, metric in our assessment. So what we found is in controls, the PASPs are around 20, and, but the obese individuals had mean PA pressures around 30, and then even much more marked in metabolic syndrome individuals. None of these individuals, they were excluded if they had any known significant pulmonary disease. Now, many of these individuals, we had about a 30% um, association or known prevalence of um, obstructive sleep apnea, and more, it was higher in the metabolic syndrome than the obese group, but clearly, these individuals had no other known pulmonary disease, at least based on clinical screening. And what we found was that in age and sex adjusted models, the PA acceleration time, the shorter the PA acceleration time, the higher the PASP, was about 26 milliseconds lower in uh, metabolic heart disease patients when compared to obese. And this held true for multivariable adjusted models. And in addition with multivariable and LV parameters, really suggesting that PASP and metabolic syndrome really were associating in even when adjusted in multivariate analysis. So then the question became, so we have seen that mm -hmm. metabolic disease, uh, the cardiac, abnormal cardiac structure and function clearly worsens with a worsening metabolic phenotype. But there are very much a high uh, percentage of individuals that are just obese that ha don't have metabolic disease that are already developing abnormal structure and function. So by just looking at metabolic syndrome, we're missing a group of individuals that are already very much at high risk for preclinical heart failure. So the way we were trying to think about it is, the most important question at hand is, can we identify those that have metabolic heart disease? So really, the best way, perhaps, is to combine these two groups in terms of obesity and metabolic syndrome and really be focusing on the obesity component and who has the phenotype. Who, has who is metabolic heart disease negative that doesn't have any preclinical lesions, and who is metabolic heart disease positive, knowing that those positive individuals are the ones that are going to move on to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So we tried to go back in the cohort and actually design an approach to this in terms of looking at biomarkers. We classified individuals, our, our questions were, can we classify who has 
diastolic dysfunction, LVH, and pulmonary hypertension, and then divide the cohort up. And we did, the diastolic dysfunction was according to ASC 2016 guidelines, and again, the pulmonary acceleration time is our surrogate for PASP. LVH is indexed to uh, height to the 2.7, and the presence of pulmonary hypertension um, greater than 35. And we really wanted to look at, this is a preclinical group, so to really get a sense if there was a signal here, we wanted to have a pure cohort of no metabolic heart disease, no diastolic dysfunction, no LVH, no pH. And then we wanted to look at who is MHD positive. Did they have either some left-sided clinical lesion of diastolic dysfunction or LVH? But we mandated pulmonary hypertension to really say that there was something going on on the left side that had enough that we were starting to see a signal for pH to really see if we could see a splay in the, the biomarkers. And what our flow diagram ended up being was about the 250. We had to exclude 19 for some uh, missing data or inadequate data on the echo. And we came up to, for metabolic heart disease negative, there was 52 individuals. So they had nothing going on. They were just obese <coughs> individuals with no cardiac phenotype. And then we came to 94 individuals that we deemed as metabolic heart disease positive that met our stringent criteria. And we excluded 85 patients because we really wanted to, in this primary analysis, because there was metabolic heart disease. Some individuals that had pH but really no left-sided disease, and others that had left-sided disease but didn't make the pH cutoff. So we really wanted to be stringent about it in our primary analysis, knowing that we were losing power by doing that, but still to see what the signal would be. We did a secondary analysis where we just looked at anyone with pH um, greater than 35, and that included actually all of the 85 as well. And we saw very similar results to our primary analysis. And what did these individuals look like within the cohort by dividing it up by MHD negative? Again, if you have those two uh, obese individuals in clinic, what might they look like? <clears throat> the individuals with positive disease was the high, they were clearly the older components, uh, older individuals in our um, cohort. They, again, were probably on, even though there was no statistical difference uh, in their BMIs, they were the heavier of the groups. The diabetes now, there was still about a 40% prevalence of diabetes in the MHD positive group. But as you can see, there is about 12% of individuals with diabetes with no preclinical lesions. Hypertension was more common. And when you look at the metabolic syndrome then, the actual entity of metabolic syndrome. Obviously, higher percentage of people with metabolic syndrome with MHD positive disease, but as we had ascertained before, is that clearly the presence of metabolic syndrome does not mean that you have MHD, and higher percentage of hyperlipidemia. And these individuals were relatively matched, particularly between the um, um, obese and uh, MHD positive and negative in terms of renal function. And then we decided to look at biomarkers. And the three biomarkers we settled on were NT, pro BNP, galactin-3, and folistatin-3. And NT, pro BNP we used as our straw man, essentially. It's a well-established heart failure um, biomarker for both diagnosis and prognosis. We all know that it's a cardiac myokine secreted in times of ventricular stress, increased transmural pressure, and volume overload, atrial stretch causes its release. And then we wanted to look at galactin-3. We had done prior work looking at galactin-3. Um, it's a beta-galactoside binding lectin, and it seems to co-localize with macrophages and fibroblasts. The one issue with galactin-3 is it's not necessarily cardiac specific. It's expressed in a variety of tissues and in a lot of entities that have fibrosis, cancer, um, various cancer um, studies have found galactin-3 association. So again, it doesn't quite have that specificity with cardiac. Um, tissues per se, but there are many animal models with galactin having um, galactin infusion um, that can be adverse for cardiac function and also uh, galactin knockout mice, and those have been associated with um, attenuated hypertrophy, decreased fibrosis, and like TAC associated models. And then and it's been clearly prognostic in heart failure. We've seen it in heart failure with reduced EF. We've seen it borne out in heart failure with preserved EF. And even in just community cohorts for prediction of incident heart failure, galactin has emerged. And we had done a study prior taking a look at galactin that we found it elevated in heart failure, irrelevant of whether you were half PEF or half REF, and it didn't matter if you were um, acute or chronic heart failure, the galactin levels just remained elevated. And it had a very significant interaction with GFR. And then we chose folistatin-3. We liked folistatin-3 because it was a cardiac myokine that has 
cardiac specificity. And it's a known inhibitor of TG, TGF beta, um, including activin, which always is a protective factor. And we know that it has, um, in animal models, it activates cardiac fibroblasts and uh, promotes a hypertrophic response. But what we liked about folistatin as well is there wasn't that suppression that one sees in obesity that we often see with the NT pro BMPs and the natriuretic peptides. Folistatin 3 has had some associations in some endocrine and uh, metabolic studies where it can associate with metabolic disease. So we felt that at least it may not be suppressed in a metabolic phenotype. And when we looked at the biomarkers in relation to our preclinical lesions, we found that galactin 3, folistatin like 3, uh, as and NT pro BMP in the y axis, and mean E prime as designated in these first set of panels on the x axis, there was a mild to modest relationship um, with both galactin 3 and folistatin like 3 in uh, mean E prime. When you looked at um, LV mass, there was no relationship with any of these biomarkers, galactin, folistatin, NT pro BNP with LV mass, so really no relationship um, between the two. And then when looking at pulmonary hypertension, NT pro BNP, PASP on the X axis and the biomarkers on the Y axis, you can see that there again is that more mild to uh, moderate relationship with rho coefficients that are significant in both folistatin like three and galactin three, and NT pro BNP for all three parameters was not significant and there was no association. And so the question we wanted to ask is if you tried to see if these biomarkers could predict the presence of metabolic heart disease, what we found in our models is that galactin-3 emerged as our um, biomarker that truly could predict metabolic heart disease in these individuals in both age and sex adjusted models in a clinical risk model um, using univariate predictors that were significant. And then also, in addition to the other two biomarkers, it retained clinical uh, significance. Interestingly, though folistatin like three seemed to track very similarly in our evaluation as galactin three, when it came to predicting metabolic heart disease, folistatin like three was not significant in any of our uh, baseline models as well as our uh, multivariate models. And BNP, NT pro BNP, continued to fail as it did throughout all our assessments and was not predictive of any sort um, in our metabolic disease. And that, while perhaps not completely surprising, there had been some prior studies of looking at NT pro BMP in Pontiac HF and STOP HF where they were really looking at its association in stage A patients. And there had been an association where elevated pro BMP with intensification of therapy did help improve outcomes. So we were hope trying to see if NT pro BMP would serve um, us in our patient population, and that in fact was not the case. Some additional findings that we found that were interesting were when you divide these individuals by metabolic heart disease positive and negative, there was an emergence of RV uncoupling that we started seeing in the metabolic heart disease positive individuals. Again, no true change in <coughs> systolic pressures, but when you look at the TAPSI to PASP ratio, which is kind of a um, a more non-invasive assessment for RV uncoupling, we really saw that the metabolic heart disease individuals mean is around 0.5, and that's what we often see in heart failure with preserved EF individuals, and particularly those that have the worst outcomes and start developing RV dysfunction. And when you look at how that RV uncoupling relates to the left side of the heart, there was a pretty strong relationship of that uncoupling um, ratio in with mean E prime with a row coefficient of 0.51, and that was statistically significant. And lastly, when again, when we look at our pulmonary hypertension, we, this was a non-invasive study. We don't have invasive assessments of these individuals, but trying to make sure, did our PASP reflect what was going on the left side of the heart? When you look at the association of mean E prime on PASP, was a strong um, association with the PASP in our individuals. And while slightly lower, more of a row of uh, 0.35, there is an association that's statistically significant that with LV mass and PASP. Again, showing that what we were seeing in terms of reflected with the pulmonary hypertension was at least a sizable component potentially maybe coming from the, what was going on the left side of the heart in terms of mean E prime and LV mass to height. And I didn't put any slides in regarding our secondary analysis, but we did basically combine everybody 
looking at pH positive and negative. So really looking at metabolic heart disease with pH positive. And galactin-3 had the same, in fact, slightly stronger association with the metabolic heart disease with pulmonary hypertension, and that utilized that um, indeterminate group that I showed at that earlier slide. So really, the galactin-3 was tracking with metabolic heart disease, and it seemed like perhaps the pH was where it was really tracking with. And so to summarize to um, some of the work to date, so again, metabolic heart disease is seen in our um, high-fat, high-sucrose mo um, mouse model in Bill's uh, basic lab. Really, we can translate that out into a young, obese individuals without prevalent cardiac disease. And we are seeing um, metabolic heart disease, again, as defined by diastolic dysfunction, LVH, and pH, tracking with the degree of metabolic phenotype. And these changes, however, are occurring in obese individuals. You don't need to wait till they get metabolic syndrome. They're already starting in obesity. And it, perhaps targeting this stage is actually pretty critical. In answering the question of can we use biomarkers to predict metabolic heart disease, galactin-3, at least in the three initial candidate biomarkers that we evaluated, did in fact predict our metabolic heart disease phenotype. And one of the more provocative qu questions is really this significant presence of pulmonary hypertension in these individuals with obesity and with the early evidence of RV uncoupling. And what needs to be better evaluated is what is this mechanism of pH in these individuals? And we need to do also do perhaps better RV characterization to see um, more sophisticated mechanisms of evaluating the RV. Are they actually abnormal? And I did want to take a few minutes to talk briefly about our next steps and what our current line of investigation is. And it's been really looking at the mechanism of pH in metabolic heart disease. One thing that we saw, and I had mentioned it in a prior, the prior slide in looking at the metabolic spectrum, is we saw that the LA volume index in people who had metabolic syndrome wasn't particularly dilated. And that was something that we couldn't put our heads around because if we're arguing that there's significant left-sided disease in terms of diastolic dysfunction and LVH, we always talk about the LA being a reflectant of that kind of pressure. They should dilate. And that wasn't exactly clear and didn't quite settle well in why that might be. And one thought was, is there some increased fibrosis um, going on in these individuals where they're actually not dilating? Or is LA volume really not sensitive enough to really understand what's going on? Because my sense would be that if you have a lot of left-sided disease, you should be reflecting that in your LA, potentially with remodeling. But if not, we're seeing the pulmonary hypertension. We're seeing the effect of increased LA pressures. So maybe we need to be more sophisticated in our approach and uh, using a better metric than LA volume index. And really, could we tease out the question of LA mechanics? And so thinking about that in the last year or so, I, had, I was going through the, some of the literature and it really came across some seminal papers in this space of really thinking about how does the LA relate to the LV? And I was um, impressed to see these long um, essays, essentially, of hemodynamic um, evaluation of the left atrium done by Eugene Brownron, this was almost 60 years ago. But what was amazing on two fronts was one is the, the elegant design of the study and their detailed hemodynamic assessment, and really probably giving us a lot of the information of understanding that relationship of LV and diastolic pressure and LA pressures. But I was impressed with how they got through the IRB, 42 transeptal, bio, like, transeptal punctures, 12 being normal, and then also just doing assessments. And they did volume loading in these studies, and they took 1,500 mils of blood from these individuals 10 days prior to their study in order to, re to volume load them. So I was impressed that they were able to do all these studies back in the day. Our IRBs would not accept that <coughs> these days. But it was interesting to look at when you're looking at A <coughs> waves, B waves. When you think about our A wave, really this Z point, for example, is where when it coincides with the uh, ventricular contraction of the QRS, that seems to really corroborate well with that LV and diastolic pressure. And even when you volume load individuals and their LVDP is going up, even though you're seeing a variety of changes within that wave, that Z point at the QRS really tracks with the LVDP. So there was a lot of um, nice assessments and really kind of getting an assessment of his point with this paper was trying to understand if you have increased LVEDP in left ventricular hypertrophy, for example, if they have an LVEDP of 25, 
you can't be running around with an LA pressure of 25 or you'll be in fulminate pulmonary edema all the time. But really, that's the contribution of the LA contraction to really help facilitate LV filling by the LA is through the contraction. So it kind of gave a basis of an idea of thinking about mechanics truly in the left atrium are important in thinking about um, the left side and the LV EDP. And then um, Victor Melanovsky with David Cass have looked at very elegantly what the pressure volume loops of the left atrium are. We tend to think about the left ventricle in terms of all pressure volume loops, but really this is the loop if the fellows out there haven't seen what a atrial pressure volume loop is. And you can see that when you're filling, you get to your maximal, that would be your reservoir phase where you're filling maximally with your left uh, atrial volume. And then you have your mitral valve opens, you have early um, filling of your left ventricle, and then you have a slight increase in pressure as you get into atrial contraction into your booster phase. So really getting a sense of these changes. And when you look at, and they did this also with pressure volume uh, assessment with transeptal puncture, but you can really get a sense of what the atrial volume is and really measuring that LA ejection fraction. So we always think about LV ejection fraction, but what is going on simultaneously with the left atrium Perhaps that will give us a little bit more of an idea of how LA mechanics play into this. And when thinking about this, this was something that clearly is something I cannot pursue in our cohort in doing transeptal um, puncture and LA direct measurements. But what has moved in the um, field is really look, being able to look at LA mechanics from echocardiography from strain. And as the fellows are all, I'm sure, learning about strain and the idea of the rate of deformation of a given segment um, when you have applied pressure or force, and we're able to capture this from a pixel level and really come up with this um, a, a non-denominational, um, a number, a percentage, to assess changes in any given um, segment. You can really get an assessment and a granular idea of even in the setting of preserved systolic function, subtle abnormalities can be gleaned, and we're applying this obviously in the LV with global longitudinal strain in a variety of cardiomyopathies. But really, some of the field is moving towards really looking at strain in the LA. And we can get a sense of, again, these um, various segments of the six segments in um, the, the atrium and where are the abnormalities. And in first left atrial strain, you have this idea. So with uh, ventricular strain, we look at global longitudinal strain during systole. And that's been the more prognostic parameter that everybody is looking at. And in for atrium, similarly, this reservoir strain, when the atrium is filling maximally, PALS, peak atrial longitudinal strain, it seems to be very prognostic. In several heart failure cohort studies, we're seeing it as a predictor potentially of atrial fibrillation. So really being able to get a bit more granular about how LA mechanics also plays in part with our outcomes. And, um, and uh, in addition, you get an idea of conduit strain. What is the strain change when the LA is passively filling into the LA volume, pa passively filling into the LV? And then what, again, is that booster strain? So we really can get multiple strain assessments throughout the cycle, and then we're able to get volume assessments as well. So you really kind of have um, a nice sense of LA mechanics and how that might play into what we're seeing with diastology, the left side of the disease in terms of preclinical half path uh, would be a nice next avenue. And we've been validating our technique in, um, at BU in a what I would call the most extreme diastolic uh, phenotype, which is our amyloid patients. And one clinical question that came up that uh, I decided that we should take a look at for LA strain is we have a, a handful of individuals that we see at the BU Amyloid Center that have uh, they're in, they have known cardiac amyloid, they're in sinus rhythm, but then they have strokes But when we see them in follow-up. And really it's that idea of electrical mechanical disassociation where they're electrically in sinus rhythm, but mechanically already in atrial fibrillation. And how can we predict when these individuals are going to be, they're already mechanically compromised and we should empirically start anticoagulation. There's a few studies that have looked at this in terms of echo and have seen that if you have a mitral E wave, which is lowered if it's under 35. We actually are relatively aggressive and start our patients on anticoagulation. But even despite um, people being above 40, we've seen individuals that have had strokes. So we asked, could we look at LA strain to ascertain this better? And what we did find is that that booster strain 
was significantly decreased in comparison to our other cardiac amyloid patients um, in those who had inter um, any type of uh, thrombotic event. In addition, their stroke volume, when we can actually measure the stroke volume, uh, when looking at our LA mechanics and their emptying fraction, all these parameters were significantly decreased, which gives us a sense that there, this may provide increased sensitivity um, within thinking about um, disease entities that affect left atrial mechanics. So ultimately, this is our goal to apply now in our clinical cohort um, with our BUMET study, and then we can move forward with that. And just a quick um, few words about the next true final future directions that I'm hoping to do with the phenotyping metabolic heart disease. We're very interested in exploring additional blood biomarkers. We did a candidate three biomarkers on our initial um, kind of evaluation, but we have had some, in a pilot, we've had some um, very suggestive um, leads with GDF-15. And one idea that we've been exploring with the lab and Bill Colucci's been looking at with various of his uh, postdocs in his lab is that there may be a link with mitochondrial dysfunction with metabolic heart disease. And GDF-15 has really been emerging as potentially a mitochondrial marker. We don't have a lot of good blood biomarkers for mitochondrial dysfunction, but GDF-15 has been gaining some strength, so that's something we'll be looking at. We're hoping to apply proteomics in this space kind of in a more unbiased approach to see if we can find other biomarkers that haven't been fully vetted prior and see what emerges when we really look at these two very disparate groups of those with metabolic heart disease negative and metabolic heart disease positive group. And then we hope to apply metabol metabolomics potentially as well in the, um, the quest for newer biomarkers. What we then hope to apply are structural biomarkers by using left atrial strain to see if we can pick up in addition a better phenotypic strategy with left atrial strain in conjunction then looking at our blood biomarkers. And we're very excited about bringing back in our individuals. So these individuals came in in 2010 and 2014. And so we're bringing them back in for their visit too. So they've kind of had a mean span of time, a lapse of about six to seven years. So now we're getting blood again and we're doing echo again. So I'm very interested to see what are the changes in biomarkers? What have their metabolic phenotype has changed and what's going on with their hearts as well? It's been, we've had a quick pass of 50. And I must say everybody has progressed into some form of metabolic heart disease positive, and a lot of individuals have gained weight as well. What is interesting is we have at least five in our group that we brought back that had bariatric surgery. So we'll have a very nice small group just to see what the trends would be in terms of their metabolic phenotype. And then lastly, we're really hoping to explore physiologic biomarkers. Um, my colleague Mir Iowan and myself are have spearheaded and actually the last year have been able to start our um, invasive physiology and hemodynamics lab where we're gonna be doing invasive hemodynamics with cardiopulmonary exercise testing. We're gonna be looking at individuals with dyspnea, but we hope to have a fair amount of these individuals that are metabolic and to really understand what is driving those pH to really look at it with invasive um, parameters. So we just had our first case on Friday, so we're thrilled that it's moving, and so we'll be doing this once a month to really get a sense of things. And what I also hope to do is to really look at now that I have invasive, potentially in a small group, I can see how that relates to left atrial strain. So we get a non-invasive mechanism of what we can get some more insight of what actually might be going on from an invasive standpoint. I'd like to just acknowledge our group, Bill Colucci, who's been my mentor for the past 10 years and is also my chief mentor for my HA Fellow to Faculty Career Development Grant. Ivan Luptak, who works um, in Bill's lab, has um, been part of the, the process in thinking about metabolic heart disease and we think about our translational approaches. Vanessa Silva is my research coordinator and Nir Ayalan joined at BU the same year I did and we've been together for the last 10 years as well, so he's been a great partner. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, it was wonderful. Um, I, I just had a couple of thoughts about mechanistic thoughts, really, about what you were saying, because that's what you're looking at. Um, we have done a study years ago which showed that oxidative stress measurements as a biomarker were highly predictive of Purmi hypertension or Purmi artery pressure, even in people who didn't have any of these things, no FPAF or just in a general population of people with, uh, with coronary disease of various severity, degrees of severity. And um, 
It also predicted incident AFib as well. Mm. And when we think about metabolic disease, it really is a systemic disease. Okay. It's driven by um, glucose, fat, and so on. Right. And the heart is just one of the many organs that is being affected by this, like the kidney and the liver. Peter is sitting here. He's agreeing with me. Um, and um, so it's, it's a concentrating only on the myocardial structure and how things are dilating or not so well dilating is probably limiting your um, ability to detect progression and all those other things. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, HEF-PEF is probably dictated largely by what's happening in the arteries against which the heart is contracting and studying systemic arterial stiffness, which is also affected by metabolic disease. Right. And uh, Alana is doing a lot of these studies that uh, you'll probably hear about as you meet with us later on. Um, w these are some thoughts as to how you could expand the way in which you're assessing these people. Absolutely. No, I, I, t I completely agree. And I think there's definitely that thought in HEFPEF. Is it truly a cardiac issue, or is this really a peripheral component? And I think um, I'm hoping that the cardiopulmonary exercise testing will lend us a little bit of insight as well when you think about the more of the systemic idea. And also, I think skeletal muscle is a big uh, component with this as well of on a systemic level, you're going to see abnormalities in endothelial dysfunction in the, in the overall vasculature. But I think also exercise limitation in these individuals, I don't know if it's necessarily all dictated by the heart. I completely agree. And so taking a look at other components, we can, one thought was whether to go after, if you're doing invasive, you could do endothelial cell kind of extraction with J-wire technique to look at endothelium. So that's something we've been entertaining as well as we build this, and we're hoping to build an, a research IRB with this, then to really be able to look at on a multi-system level in addition to the heart. The lack of link between pulmonary hypertension and uh, the left atrial size that you were finding, um, one of these things, one of the reasons could be sleep. You know, well, one of the things that happens in obese people is they sleep badly. Yeah, a lot of them absolutely. Have sleep apnea, et cetera, et cetera. So, how well have you worked out your cohort? And that would cause pulmonary hypertension absolutely. independent of what's happening in the LA. Absolutely. And that's essentially why we have decided to move forward toward an invasive approach. So, then you can really tease out if you're seeing abnormal um, left atrium kind of mechanics, what is going on with the pulmonary system, and is this disproportionate? And then we'll also have a better assessment of, you know, is this more of a pulmonary contribution, or is this actually something that's going on with the left side? So I think having the invasives is critical. So absolutely, that's why we're trying to move that line of inquiry to get a little bit better answers. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so I'm an endocrinologist who does cardiovascular science. And I would encourage you to get cleaner metabolic syndromers. I think you can guess where I'm going. Because you have so much diabetes in some of your key groups. So I think if you could figure some way to recruit more metabolic syndromers without such high glucoses. Yeah. Because my guess is the critique you're getting for some of your papers is where's your A1C data and is that associated with some of your markers? Sure. So, you know, is there a way to do that? Could you? Are you stuck with, so to speak, these 252 people? I would encourage you to get another 100 of non-diabetics metabolic syndromes. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, definitely. I will say that we didn't have, um, these were not uncontrolled diabetics. I mean, I don't think we had anyone with A1Cs above 8. Uh, however, your point is well taken. You're, you, it's a mixed phenotype, and that is why we try to go after a little bit of the obese without diabetes. But absolutely, we are... We can re-recruit off this, um, but it would, it would require a little bit of um, changes, and I think it would make more sense perhaps to go after um, maybe a, just a straight-up new cohort where we like redesign it, where we're able to do it, and also embed more of the invasive component. As a follow-up, the American Diabetes Association has no policy on screening diabetics, uh, for uh, especially 30 to 50-year-olds. So don't drop off the diabetics. We need information on both. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. One more from Andy. Yeah, so the, the HEFPEP world has been an interesting one. There's you know, several pages of negative studies, 
and, and uh, the uh, it does appear that obesity, if you look at most what's most predictive is really BMI over 35, right. um, and also when it combined with with diabetes, um, it's also interesting that. Uh, the exercise studies that often these patients may have somewhat normal resting hemodynamics, but you exercise them and things shoot way up. Right. Um, so uh, just uh, I just encourage everybody to pay attention to some studies that are uh, looking at uh, treatment with SGLT2 inhibitors and, and those types of things. We have a study for, for patients who are hospitalized with PEPPEP and diabetes, they're actually going to remove the diabetes component from that. But all the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, ARBs, all of that, so uh, have not shown benefit. Um, what's your thought about, as you look at the left atrial situation, um, the role of pericardial fat and how that might impact hemodynamics? There's actually some thinking that pericardial fat and thickness may play a role in, in why there's not an increase in uh, BNP and, and other things that are seen in, in these very obese patients, and, and how do you look at that echocardiographically? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I don't think echo is going to be our way of looking at it, unfortunately. I think we have a lot of nice studies looking at MR and association of pericardial fat risk and heart failure. Um, I do think it's, it, it's a very important question, all these individuals. It's, it's challenging imaging, as is with uh, the echoes, but I think I don't think there's a systematic way within echocardiography. But your point's well taken. I think trying to understand, um, you know, if we're able to embed any additional imaging, maybe from an MR perspective, and then do hemodynamics, we would be able to tease that out a little bit better. But I, you're absolutely right, and I, I don't think we'd be able to do it in our current framework of our study. Okay. Well, I, I think we're about out of time. But thanks again for a great talk. Thank it you. was really great. Thanks for coming. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.